And tonight, I'm Lawrence Fox, identifying as Martin Daubney. Coming up on the show tonight, it's the 7th of July, but you wouldn't know it looking at the mainstream media news coverage today. There is scant mention of the 52 people who died at the hands of Islamist terrorists in London in 2005, or the 770 people who were injured. Well, tonight, we will be remembering them. Then, Bushra Sheikh, political commentator, and Paul Conyu, author and former editor of the Sunday Mirror, will talk about Keir Starmer's U-turns. Plus, we get a sneak peek. There he is, Sir, Sir Keir Fensitter. Plus, we get a sneak peek at Boris Johnson's mail column tomorrow that shows he's on the warpath over Ulez. Talking of which, are motorists fighting back? Because Ulez has been in court this week and over in Cambridge, a new Conservative councillor won on an anti-congestion charge ticket. So, where does that leave Ulez in London, as well as similar schemes in Bath, Oxford and Birmingham? Now, as ever, of course, you are my third panellist. Please get in touch on all of the topics, particularly how safe do you feel in Britain? GBviews at gbnews.com. That's all coming up, plus that's after the latest news headlines with Ray Addison. Thanks, Martin. Here's the latest from the GB Newsroom. Our top story, the gunman who killed a beautician outside a pub in Merseyside on Christmas Eve has been sentenced to life and will serve a minimum of 48 years for her murder. 26-year-old Ellie Edwards was killed by Connor Chapman outside the Lighthouse pub in the Wirral last year. The 23-year-old fired 12 shots from a submachine gun, injuring several others before fleeing the scene. Chapman was found guilty after a three-and-a-half-week trial at Liverpool, Liverpool Crown Court. Ellie's father, Tim Edwards, spoke after the sentencing. Thankfully, now he's got 48 years and hopefully he never sees Christmas again. Um, if I'm lucky enough to still be around for a long time, yeah, I will do my best to make sure he never comes out of jail. A man who killed a mother and her two young daughters by setting fire to their flat in Nottingham has been jailed for life and will serve a minimum term of 44 years. 31-year-old Jamie Barrow was found guilty of murdering his neighbour, Fatumata Haidara, and her daughters, Fatima and Neymar, in Clifton last year. The court heard that he poured petrol through their letterbox before setting it alight and watching the fire take hold. Abu Bakar Drama, husband of Fatou Mata, spoke after sentencing. Today is not a happy day for us. Barrow's sentence does not bring them back. However, justice has been done, and we will never be able to, and he will never be able to inflict the pain he has caused our family on anyone else. An eight-year-old girl and a 40-year-old woman remain in a life-threatening condition in hospital following yesterday's crash at a school in Wimbledon. Another eight-year-old girl was killed after a Land Rover crashed through a fence and into the study prep school. The driver, a 46-year-old woman arrested on suspicion of causing death by dangerous driving, has now been bailed pending further inquiries. More than 300 people were intercepted in small boats in the English Channel in the early hours of this morning. It's the first crossing in seven days following poor weather. GB News understands that the boats pushed off from a 60-mile stretch of the French coastline from Dunkirk to Boulogne. It brings the total number of crossings so far this year to over 11,700. We're on TV, online, on DAB Plus Radio and on TuneIn 2. This is GB News. Back now to Martin. On this day, on July the 7th, 2005, four Islamist terrorists exploded suicide bombs on the London transport network, killing 52 and injuring more than 770 others. Ordinary Londoners, simply trying to get to work at rush hour, were obliterated, maimed and scarred forever. It was Britain's worst terrorist atrocity since the Lockerbie bombing in 1988. And may they all rest in peace. World leaders issued a joint statement read by then Prime Minister Tony Blair. Condemn utterly these barbaric attacks. All of our countries 
have suffered from the impact of terrorism. Those responsible have no respect for human life. London mourned. On the streets, police were armed. Snipers, sniper units tailed at least 12 known Al-Qaeda operatives on British soil with orders of shoot to kill. New laws were rushed through to outlaw the encouragement and instigation of terrorism with promises to tackle a radical Islam that was poisoning British mosques and British mines. And while three of the terrorists were British-born sons of Pakistani immigrants who signally praised Osama bin Laden as a beloved hero, Blair flagged the emerging threat of overseas terrorists arriving on our shores. Just eight days after the attack, Blair promised fresh moves to stop extremists entering the UK and stronger powers to deport them. Yet Blair's words ring hollow in 2023. Right now, we know there are at least 19 suspected terrorists in the UK who've entered illegally via dinghies. They're affiliated with some of the most murderous groups in the entire world, including ISIS. Yet instead of deporting them, we're putting them up in four-star hotels. And you're paying for that, and lefty lawyers are blocking their deportation. Yet today, the 7-7 anniversary wasn't even mentioned on the BBC or Sky News homepages. The BBC instead chose to point out that 7-7 is actually International Kissing Day. And they illustrated that with a picture of two lesbians embracing. All too often, the establishment media looks the other way when stories don't fit their narrative. It's a similar tale every year on the anniversary of the brutal murder of Lee Rigby, again by Islamist terrorists. Perhaps the media's reluctance to mock these painful anniversaries while falling over themselves to mock correctly the murder of Stephen Lawrence is because these suspects, these stories, upset their holy worldview. The worldview that the multicultural dream can sometimes turn into a nightmare that unfettered immigration and the resulting ghettoization of the UK has, in some cases, caused division and the perfect breeding ground for radicalisation and even grooming gangs. And the risk all of this surely increases when the media, the police and politicians appear to turn a blind eye for fear of being called racist. But by ignoring painful events like 7-7, they not only betray the memories of the dead, the injured and the families and friends who still to this day mourn their loss on this painful anniversary. Their silence gives cover to the enemies who walk in the shadows among us. Their silence increases the likelihood of these tragic events happening on British soil again. Their silence shames us all. So, tonight, I am asking you, how safe is Britain? Get in touch, email gbviews at gbnews.com or, of course, course, tweet us at gbnews. So, how likely is a repeat of a terror attack like 7-7 on British soil? Just 10 days ago, Iraqi intelligence officials emerged that terrorists from Islamic State have been plotting to carry out a large-scale atrocity in the United Kingdom, Iraqi intelligence officials have revealed. Well, joining me now to discuss this is Will Geddes, security specialist and CEO of threat management firm International Corporate Protection Group. Good evening to you, Will, and thank you for joining us. So I'd like to start, what is the um, current terror rating in the UK and how does that compare to normal? Well, the, the, the threat level right now, Martin, is at substantial, which means that a terrorist attack is likely. Now, that is it's a sort of midway point between the highest and the lowest levels. So the security services uh, and the anti-terrorism police and the various agencies, obviously, that contribute the intelligence that then forms this threat level uh, are putting it at a very medium level. Now, this is evidently something that they have to be very conscious of and have been especially conscious of obviously since the tragic events of 7-7, when they underestimated the potential threat that was going to materialise. So since that time, the threat level has adjusted, and like any good threat level system, it needs to adjust, because it will have no value to anybody if people can't see that it's fluctuating and understanding at times when they can be vigilant or when they should be vigilant, because nobody can remain hypervigilant at all times. 
Uh, Will, we heard at the start of the show there that um, Tony Blair and the immediate aftermath just 10 days after the attack on 7-7 promised tough new laws uh, to protect our borders and to deport known terrorists. Yet we know at the moment there are at least 19 terrorists in the UK who entered the country illegally via dinghies. Where did we go so wrong? Where did we go so soft on terrorism? Well, to be honest, I, I, I'm not involved in the legislation. Unfortunately, I pick up the pieces where that legislation falls, falls short and it certainly, it certainly falls foul in terms of enabling individuals that can exploit and, and opportune by the weaknesses that there are in place. One of the biggest challenges, and I think you know, one can't forget that the various agencies involved in not only the counterterrorism efforts, but also those within the border force have been trying incredibly hard to try and prevent obviously, and curb the number of individuals that are illegally getting into the country. But one of the considerable risks is that there are not only those that innocently want to come and take asylum in this country, a great country of ours, uh, but there are inevitably going to be those with malintent who want to infiltrate back into the United Kingdom to carry out whatever actions they, 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 they may choose. Now, the 19 that you mention is a very, very small percentage of those that are actually on the current watch list. And the constant challenge that the security services and counterterrorism policing have is in prioritizing who they believe could be the potentially greatest threat. So that list will adjust in terms of those subjects of interest that will be focused on. But as technology is in enhanced and, and improved, and certainly that's come a long way in the last 18 years, we're now in a position where technology can take a good dominance in terms of intercepting communications, of identifying chatter, and certainly working with our partners overseas to try and find out what we can do to try and prevent those coming into the country that really do have uh, terrorist intent. OK, well, let's cut to the chase here. Um, we know there are 19, but they're, they're the ones that have been fingerprinted previously in different countries. They just happen to show up on our system. We also know that some 98% of people arriving on our shores illegally via dinghies don't even have passports or any credible documentation to prove who they are. So let's be honest, we don't know who's coming in the country, and surely... It stands to reason that if so many thousands of military-aged young men are coming in with no documentation of proof of who they are, then malicious intent must be there and the terror, the terror threat to Britain must be increased. Well, yes, it, it would be, certainly in terms of those that are connecting with other individuals already established in the country, and very rarely will we see um, individuals that will then come into the country and try and establish a cell, although that does happen. We do also have the lone actors, and we've seen many of those over the last 18 years. I mean, there have been 21 notable terrorist incidents since 7-7 in this country. However, the number that are thwarted by the security services and foiled at the very late stage stages of those plans uh, have been considerable sight more than that. Uh, and certainly in terms of the notable ones, the disclosed one, there have been 15 disclosed major, major uh, terrorist plots that have been foiled. But the concern, as you rightly say, is those that come into the country with no identification, that have been smuggled in, that have been able to establish themselves in this country, I think the greater risk, I think probably most people are concerned about, is general criminality. Now, that's not to diminish or dilute mm. the terrorism aspect, because Islamic State are certainly a prevalent and more prominent threat than even al-Qaeda are these days, certainly here in the United Kingdom. But it's the standard criminality, and quite often, again, joining the dots together, you will get many of those that commit terrorist acts that will have had a grounding in some low-level criminality beforehand. Yeah, absolutely. Now, if we continue the um, strand of logic here, Will, um, if the threat to our peace and safety is increased because we don't know who's here, then all the politicians and the NGOs and the charities and the lawyers who facilitate the arrival and block the deportation of these individuals, are they exacerbating and increasing the UK's security threat? I think they are, but I think where the complexities are is within the legislation and within the legal framework of human rights and those that are, uh, are entitled to a fair asylum. And I, I don't believe anybody is necessarily opposed to a fair asylum of someone who is going to come to this country and contribute in a positive way to the economy, to the community and everything else. Now, one of the things which has greatly enhanced, certainly since 2005, has been the various communities of those foreign nationals 
models that have come over uh, that are embedded within their communities, are working with those communities who are self-policing. Many of them are reporting those that have malintent to the authorities, and they're working collaboratively uh, within this country as part of our nation to assist and ensure that those other individuals that may be uh, from their, their, their previous countries are not coming here and going to cause harm. So, you know, it's a complex situation. Yes, there are NGOs which are opposing deportations, but the grounds of those deportations are, are very flimsy uh, in, in terms of some of those individuals that may be entitled, but also they're very flimsy in terms of the government in being able to extricate those those individuals and send them back to their home nation, which probably those home nations in many regards are probably quite grateful to get rid of. But surely if, we, if they're known terrorists with, with links to the Islamic State, I mean, what more evidence do you need to deport an individual back to their home nation? Well, again, I agree with you entirely. And, uh, and as to the, the legal frameworks, Martin, I'm probably not the best guy to ask about international law. Uh, my field is security. Um, but certainly in terms of the resources that the uh, security services and the counterterrorism police have, you know, they can monitor these individuals to see whether they are undertaking preparations or planning or propagating any sort of propaganda for their particular agenda uh, or their terrorism group. And, and ultimately, you you know, it's those individuals that only once they've got that evidence, and in our fair and just legal system, which you know we're all potentially vulnerable to or protected by, depending on your perspective, they have to have that sufficient evidence to present to say this individual does have malintent, and they can, with justification, deport them. So it's a very complicated matter. I don't think I necessarily agree with it, Martin, as it currently stands, uh, and I think you and I are, are like-minded in that regard. But. The, 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 we have one of the best legal systems in the world, but sadly, it can be played against us. And it seems to be toothless in the face of overriding evidence. One final question for you, Will, succinctly, if you could. One of the clampdowns Blair promised was on radical Islamism uh, that was poisoning mosques and young minds. With your ear on the ground from an, an intelligence perspective, how successful do you think that work has been and how dangerous do you think the threat is from Islamist terrorists within the UK still to this day? Well, that's two parts, Martin. I'll cover the first part, which is really in terms of the success in clamping down on radical Islamic groups. Uh, that, again, goes back to the point I was making earlier about those communities working hand in hand with the authorities to obviously report and assist and support into any intelligence. And that's not snitching. It's simply saying there are individuals here who are going to tar us with the same brush. But on the second side, do we still face a threat? Absolutely, without a question. Uh, but it's not something that people necessarily have at the front of their mind every single day unless they see shows like this, which remind them uh, that that threat does still prevail. So, you know, we're not out of the woods by any shape or form yet until we get some sort of process in place to ensure that those that do have a history and can be recorded and are documented from their home nations uh, and have association to terrorist groups can be deported, we, that threat will prevail. OK, thank you, Will Geddes. Thanks for having us on the show. We'll have to leave it there. Thank you very much. You're watching and listening to GB News still to come. Drivers are pushing back against congestion charges, low-traffic neighbourhoods and ULEs. But before that, more from my panel. We'll be back in three. The temperature's rising. Boxed Solar, proud sponsors of weather on GB News. Hello again, it's Aidan McGiven here from the Met Office with the GB News forecast. A sunny and hot weekend at first for some before the inevitable thundery breakdown and much fresher conditions arrive from the Atlantic. We've got a couple of areas of low pressure spinning out to the west of the UK. They're helping to draw up this increased heat and humidity before they send some weather fronts in and we see this thundery breakdown later Saturday and into Sunday. But before that happens, a clear and dry night for many. We will see the cloud thicken across Wales and the southwest, and some showers will push into Devon and Cornwall by dawn. But it's a muggy night wherever you are, 17, 18, 19 Celsius fairly widely. Even in the north of Scotland, mid-teens are possible. But a fine start for Scotland and for much of England first thing Saturday. Sunny skies, temperatures shooting up, but the showers in the southwest will quickly push into central areas, developing into an intense area of thundery rain by the afternoon, with the risk of localised flooding, large hail and frequent lightning, particularly towards the Midlands into northern England and southern Scotland later. But ahead of that rain, 
could reach the low 30s in East Anglia. Much fresher conditions arrive by the start of Sunday. Any thundery rain clearing for the north of Scotland, but further spells of wet weather likely to brush past southeast England before some heavy showers and thunderstorms develop across Northern Ireland, Wales and the southwest into the afternoon. We keep the showers and some thunderstorms into the start of next week, but it also turns cooler. The temperature's rising. Boxed Solar, proud sponsors of weather on GB News. Welcome back to the show. I'm Martin Daubney, in for Lawrence Fox. We'll join me in the studio now is Bushra Sheikh, political commentator and anti-racism campaigner and author and former newspaper editor Paul Conu. So, um, good evening to you both. I want to start on the story of how safe is Britain. We've been talking um, on the anniversary of 7-7. Paul, I'd like to turn to you first, because it really struck me today, um, as a journalist of 28 years myself, a, a shocking lack of coverage in the mainstream media about this anniversary. And I want to put it to you as, as a former newspaper man. Do newspapers and TV channels have an agenda when it comes to what they report? Because it seems to me they like to turn a blind eye to the anniversary, for example, of Lee Rigby's murder and the anniversary of 7-7, but they'd much happily rather report on things like Stephen Lawrence. Does the media have an agenda? Are they turning a blind eye for fear of being called racists? I agree with you on, on one point. Martin, and that's that this wasn't covered at all, really, in any of the of the newspapers or across the broadcast media today, which I think is a, is an omission. Um, but it wasn't. It's not down to you know to the right wing press or the left wing press, the, lib the liberal press or the conservative press. I just think it's uh, 
short-termism. I mean, I've got a vivid memory of this, both journalistically and because Hutchie, I began that day, July the 7th, that day, uh, escorting my young, two young sons as a, as a parent, helping on a school trip when we came very close to being caught. Well, we were caught up in it, but luckily weren't, we weren't on the tube we were aiming for. So I've got vivid memories of this, so I'm a, a little biased. It should, have, it should have got more attention in the media, but I don't think it's, it's one where it, it was the Liberal media ignoring it. it, 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 it wasn't in the Daily Mail, it wasn't in the Daily Express or the Daily Telegraph today. So it's not, it, it's not about you know, whether you're left or right, liberal or conservative. Well, how true is that, Bushra? Because I, 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 I mean, here we are on, on GB News you know, talking about this, having a, a conversation where I think it's important. Absolutely. And I do believe. Um, that the media would rather turn... We've seen it with the police, with politicians mm. around grooming gangs in Rotherham. Mm. Certainly, I believe, that people would rather look away when a story like this upsets the narrative. I mean, you could argue the case that... I mean, the, the, the whole general media has a responsibility to report accurately. And that also includes stories that are going to upset people, you know, because... Uh, Having the media is about the truth, what's actually happening out there, what is affecting regular people's daily lives, so that that responsibility is there. And the fact that we haven't seen much of it being reported, perhaps there is, you know, this, this, kind, of, this kind of conversation that exists that we can't have the conversation. You know, which is why the media are not talking about it enough, because they're worried about, you know, what the, the, the public might turn around and say. I and mean, you, know, you are talking about racism and, you, you know, ostracising certain groups. But if you feel like that, you can still talk about it. We cannot censor the media. They have to report accurately and they have to put the right stories out. But I don't think this is censorship. I think, it, I think in a sense, it's laziness or, sh or just short-termism, you know, so they're not looking back in that direction. But the idea that it's sort of a political decision you know, to to not look back at t t July the seventh. I just don't buy that. I just well, think may, it's may, you know, it, it could, you could argue it's bad editorial judgment, but it's not sinister in the sense that it's censorship or well, it, trying is to it, bury it, it. Is that the case? I mean, you could say that it shows a lack of focus on priorities. I mean, to me, this this is a, a story of huge priority and of national significance. The fact it didn't occur to editors of the BBC in particular, I, I think, is shocking. But we must accept, we heard from the Rotherham Grooming Gangs report that the media and, and politicians were, were complicit in the fear of how those stories would, would be perceived as racist, as Islamophobic. There was self-censorship. And all I'm saying is, I think there's, there's certainly today, I've been contacted by a lot of veteran groups that I'm a part of, saying that they, they felt very, very offended that this hadn't been dealt with with the respect I can, I, I, can re I respect that, uh, that opinion. Per personally, if I'd been editing, I would have found room somewhere to look at it. But that's a question of editorial judgments. I don't think, we, I don't think we're talking about censorship or a conscious decision. Let's not in any way look right. back on, on July the 7th. You know, I'm glad you're doing it, but, uh, but th I don't think we should read too much into this in, in, in sinister right. terms. OK, let's move on to... We had Will Geddes on, um, anti-terror expert, a moment ago, and I specifically put it to him, um, is, the, is the threat of terror attack in the UK um, being increased by the fact um, we have 98% um, of people arriving illegally to this country don't have documentation, we don't know who they are, there are at least 90 known terrorists mm. walking amongst us. And he said, yes the terror threat is being increased by ostensibly open borders. I mean, look, that would obviously make sense. If you don't know who's coming into your country and you don't know who they are, then technically it would mean that that terrorism threat is going to grow. I, I mean, ideally for me, from my perspective, this is all about the processing system and it's about understanding who these people are, right? So when we talk about the boats, when we talk about immigration, we need to start establishing what that process is going to look like. If you have got people coming in and intelligence services are, will, of course, be involved because they know mm. who these individuals are. This is information that even we're not privy to that we don't know. And what surprises me, actually, is why, why I did want to take it to, is even when we talk about, when we look about the Manchester arena bomb uh, attack, the, the, that terrorist yeah. attack. Intelligence knew about this individual, OK? And they could have stopped it. They even apologised about it. So when we talk about immigration, we talk about national security, we talk about the security services. If they know there is a threat amongst these people, they should be doing something about it. So those two things need to exist. But Manchester at the same time. was a was a huge failure by the intelligence services. You know, let's be honest about it. But our intelligence services have got a good record generally, but they but there are failures, and that was a massive and monumental failure. 
But in the immediate aftermath of 7-7, Tony Blair, then Prime Minister, within days promised a clampdown on people arriving to our shores illegally and also a huge um, revving up to deport known terrorists. That patently isn't happening. If we have at least 19 known terrorists amongst us who aren't being deported, somewhere along the line, Paul, we've gone badly, badly well, wrong. A, a, I'm not sure how solid the information is about the 19, but, but yes, yes, without doubt, there are going to be people who slip into the the country who are who are dangerous and that's one of the challenges for the intelligence services and you know and for the police but I'd also argue I'd also argue though that one of the problems is that until we have a proper asylum sy checking system we're not going to beat the the, the, the gangs up op op operating the small boats and that is that is that is is the problem and what, and short of actually preventing yep. any sort of immigration, but how you do that or any migration, is you know is a is a huge question mark. We need we need immigration. What we need though is a proper structure. But we don't need terrorists, Bushel. We don't. Of course, need we don't need terrorists. We don't need terrorists amongst us. And, and what I'm saying is, now we we seem to have a systemic failure to deport known agitators. Yep. Tony Blair promised this in, in seven, on 7-7, seven, seven, back when it happened in 2005. To this day, we're not doing that. We've lost our way. OK, fine. And the thing is, even I will speak of this, and it's really important to understand that even for me and our communities that we keep our country safe, I do not want terrorists coming across, coming in the no boats and coming, because nobody does. So what we're actually saying here is we don't want to vilify and discriminate, uh, and discriminate sorry, mm. against migration. That's not what we're trying to do. And I feel like there is this amplified terror or fear that by talking about it, we're going to make people feel that all migrants are these criminals. But then on the other hand, we do need to have the processing. And somebody like T Tony Blair, who said that those processing systems would be there and available or not, we have to then do something about it, which means if they come, you've got to send them back. You've got to send them away. We cannot have them in well, our I'm country. A, I'm a Labour supporter and, broadly speaking, a Tony Blair admirer, with the exception of Iraq. And we... Part of the problems we've got now, uh, you know, are the legacy of our of our own flawed inv involvement in Iraq. OK, that's interesting. Yeah, uh, th that, that has been sort of looked at and dismissed by inquiries over the years. I don't, are we really talking about Britain's historic involvement in, in wars causing terror threats today? Or are we simply um, conflating that with the idea that we simply have no idea who's coming into the country, and even when we do know that they are terrorists, we are, we are, we are provably failing to deport them? And as Will Geddes just said, that is ramping up. And I totally agree with what you're saying. Mm. But if we know who the bad eggs are, yeah. we should get rid of the bad eggs. Then the rest of you know, the rest of the people won't be told with that same brush. But until we do that, yeah. we have this state of fear. But Martin, yeah. then comes the mechanism for how how you how you get rid of them when you when you identify. Deport them. Well, you just have to send them well, back. If you have any inclination that this person could be a terror... What's a terrorist the mechanism for sending them back? Put them on a plane and send them back to where they came from. Isn't that what well, deportation you know? is? Half the time you don't know where they came from, so which is, which is catch-22. Ultimately, ultimately, honestly, this is what I believe. I believe that Boris shut down the safe pathways in many countries where people could actually go to in, in their own country and have a processing system, I which did. means that they could be, um, you know, they could apply and we could check these people before they got here. Those things have gone. OK, we have, we exactly. have, we, we have to exactly. leave it there. A great balanced debate. Let us know what you think out there. Have we failed as a country? Have we failed to deliver on the promise that Blair made us? Are the lawyers leading us by the nose? Are we simply impotent to remove the threat amongst us? OK, let's move on now, including from um, Bash Bushra and Paul after the break. We still have Ulair to cover and Sir Fence sitter Keir Starmer. Don't go away, you'll miss out.
Welcome back to the show. I'm Martin Daubney, standing in for Lawrence Fox. Well, you've been getting in touch in your droves about tonight's show, and here's what you've had to say so far. Wendy, first word to you, quite simply, I do not feel safe in the UK anymore. Wendy, I think a great many people will agree with you, and that's not fear-mongering. I think they just look at what they see in the news, and on anniversaries like today, that feeling is certainly heightened. Next point from Malcolm who says there is an ever-present threat because the bleeding heart liberals remain complacent and complicit. Malcolm, that point was echoed by Will Geddes, security expert at the top of this show, saying absolutely the people who facilitate the, the friction-free entrance of unknown, undocumented people to our country does increase our security rate. A viewer on Twitter says the following. It used to be safe, but it's not anymore. So straight to the point. Clive on Twitter says the following. Why are you trying to frighten people? Of course we're safe compared to most of the world. Well, Clive, it's a fair point. But I think on anniversaries like today, we are justified in taking a look back and also a look forward. Where do we stand in terms of the modern situation in Britain? It's a conversation I think is well worth having, and I'm proud to have it when the rest of the mainstream media today haven't. OK, moving on to our next debate. I'm joined in the studio again still by Bushra Sheikh, political commentator and anti-racism campaigner and author and former newspaper of editor of The Sunday Mirror, Paul Conyu. On to our next topic. Sakir Fence-Sitter has been at it again. On Thursday, he hinted he'd like to scrap Ulez. Yet when pushed on it this morning, Stormer pulled yet another U-turn... I, I, I accept that the mayor has no choice but to go ahead because of the legal obligation on him. I think Dan is right to stick up for his constituents. And I've so you always do support found... the rollout on August 29th? I, 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 you know, I understand the pain it's going to uh, inflict. No, 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 but... sorry, the question was, do you support the rollout? I don't think there's an alternative, Nick. I... Another screeching U-turn, more than Jeremy Clarkson. But why are we surprised on Brexit, immigration, border control, net zero and gender identity? Starmer has had more positions than the Karma Sutra. Which got me thinking, what does Sir Keir Starmer actually stand for? What are his policies? Well, let's ask my panel. Paul, as um, somebody from the traditional Labour left... Stormer seems to switch positions like he changes his suits. Well, On Brexit, he was, he, char he was in head of the people's vote. Now he's let's make Brexit work. On immigration, first he was a refugees welcome merchant, then he was suddenly a Farage-style strong borders. On net zero, a green revolution, yet a U-turn. On the North Sea oil situation after the policy bombed in Scotland. What does Stormer stand for? Well... On you, Les, I think you're right, he is fence-sitting, fence but, it, but there's somebody else is U-turning because Boris Johnson's a column in tomorrow's Daily Mail, he goes full, a full frontal attack on you, Les, calls, it, uh, calls Sadiq Khan, the Mayor of London, as boneheaded, calls it an odious scheme, attacks on motorists. The only problem with that is that who was the man behind Ulez in 2015? It was Boris Johnson, when Mayor of London. So this sits very... I mean, as you know, I'm one of the authors of a book called Boris Johnson, Media Creation, Media Clown, Media Casualty, and this is a sort of hypocrisy and a sort of opportunistic U-turns you'd expect from well, Boris. You, you, but you've opportunistically swivelled on a sixpence there to, to, to avoid answering a question about Stormer no, and instead turn it no, into a tag I've, on Boris. No, I've, I've, been you, I've been critical I'll ask you the question again. What does Keir Stormer stand for? What are his policies? His, his policies are... <laughs> I mean, for example, I think his policies are broadly right, but I think he's being cowardly what over are they? the failure of Brexit. And I also think I also think that he is he is he is wrong on a, on a number of, is, of is, issues. But the best thing about Keir Starmer is he's, is, he's, is he's not Richie Sunak and he's not Boris Johnson. And in a, and in a sense, we are looking and unless a, a political miracle happens, we are looking at, at our next prime minister. Well, Bush, but, think... but on the on the Ulers, I, I, I think he is sitting on the fence, but frankly, so, so am I, because I think in health terms, especially for our children, Ulez is important. But I think, I think at the moment it should be delayed because it, against the backdrop of a cost-of-living crisis, it it doesn't work. So, Paul, so, so basically... But Boris Johnson is wrong, is, is wrong Basically, too. you agree with Keir Stormer, 
you don't like it, we should postpone it, yet we've got to do it. Again, it's, it's two positions on the same thing. Oh, Bushra, hang on I, a second, like, Bushra, over, over to you, Bushra. I, I, yeah, I'll, be, I'll be frank, I'm actually, Martin, I'm currently trying to get over your... <laughs> Your description of the Kama Sutra yeah, and sorry. cursed armor right now, and that's not that's not very nice in my imagination. But you actually made an interesting point. At least with Sunak, we know what we're going to get. I feel like cursed armor is always ping ponging. Mm. He never actually convicts on what he's going to do and what he's pledging for this country. I, I, I feel like he's always this pendulum that's swinging. He doesn't want to have a fixed position. And he's done the same thing with the Ulez as well. He's done the same thing. How can you have two different ideas well, hang, about the well, Ulez? Hang on. When it comes to Sunak, this is the man who, who skips PMQs more than anyone else on, in history, and this is the same period of time, who actually ducks parliamentary debates and votes on it Things, things like the Partygate report. He, he's a he, he's a man yeah. who who's terrified of scru of scrutiny. Okay, Paul. Um, we've got some more footage now because there was another U-turn by Keir Starmer yesterday when he was interrupted by some Labour students. Let's take a look at that. Not just Want economic powers. Pledge. Reinstate your pledge for 28 billion per year. I gave my I, on the mission on uh, green you power. We did that last week. We've so done that one. Will you just? Young people Which want side are the Labour we, Party on? We are on the side of economic growth. Will you just let me please get on with this? Thank you very much. So Bushford, there we go, and that's that's his own voters, you know, Labour students saying. That's healthy. No, no, they're, <laughs> not. What, 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 they're saying, but they're accusing yeah. him of another U-turn. His own party members, his own youth activists, say yeah. no more U-turns on net zero, and that, of course, is around his ULES position yeah. flip-flopping, and also around switching on North Sea oil. So even his Thank own you. people are saying, you know, stop doing so many yeah. positions. He, he honestly needs to make a decision and stick with it. And I, I genuinely believe that people are perhaps now considering the cursed armor isn't the person that they thought that he was and I certainly never backed him from the beginning I knew this within his personality traits that this was going to happen at the moment I feel like maybe because people are feeling slightly disheartened by the Tories the only side that they can go on is Labour's and he is the only option that they have but when we see imagery like that you cannot have any assurance as they're... a leader like mm. him mm. no no mm. way at least there they weren't grabbed and dragged off the stage as, a, as much would have happened if it had been the same thing at a Tory at, at a Tory event. But look, I disagree, I disagree with Starmer on, you know, on Brexit, mm. for example, and I've said so very clearly. He's being counted there. Brexit is not working. But, but the fact is, I think at the moment... How can you say, the how, moment, how can you say moment, Brexit's not moment, working? Lay, we lay, haven't really had a Brexit. Yes, we have had a Brexit, a, a, a Brexit that was a, the biggest mis-selling scandal in our recent political history. It was never no, going to work. We can't go work. into Brexit, I've been told. No, go on. So, back, but look, back to Starmer. Yeah. Back, back to Starmer. You know, you, you, I don't think you've sufficiently answered the question about what does... Will the real Keir Starmer please stop taking the knee, stop sitting on a fence... Stand up. The, stand up. <laughs> what do you believe in? Tell us your position I on can Brexit. Tell, you... tell us your position on net zero. Don't keep changing. Just tell us what you really well stand for. I think, I think if, you're being, if you're being a pragmatist, the, the, the only slogan, and I, I'm being cynical now, but the only slogan Labour really need for the next election is time for a change. Those four words no, I, are what I, is I going think, to decide the next election. I think Martin's hit the nail on the head. We need to say, will the real cursed armour please stand up? Yes, yeah, we I'm need to see. Well, who is the real, Richie Su it. the real Rishi Sunak but come I, but to I, that? I, I, Have you I, seen I, Sunak's poll Paul, rating? Hang on, hang on, hang on. I, I think it's, it's a depressing state of affairs if, if the Labour just think all we've got to do is keep quiet and don't make any mistakes. All we've got to do is just keep shifting our position because we're not as bad as the Tories. Where's the aspiration in, in people who voted Tory last time? Just but the economic for crisis who, the Tories have given... Any of the above? But the mm. economic crisis the Tories have, uh, have caused with, <laughs> in many ways... Is, it was quite pragmatic for Labour to row back Rachel Reeves to say that we can't pledge to spend 28 billion or borrow 28 billion every year okay. on a climate change target. That is, that is, that we're, is we're, practical and real. We're going to have to leave it there. Um, I don't know about you or you're as confused as me. I, I still don't know what Stormer stands for. Still as confused. We'll have to leave it there. Thank you to our panel, Bushra Sheikh and Paul Conyu. Next, motorists are driving change and people are putting the handbrake on ULEZ, congestion charges and LTNs. About time, if you ask me, back in three.
Welcome back. I'm Martin Dorby, standing in for Lawrence Fox. Now, are we seeing the beginnings of a people's revolt against so-called clean air zones? Well, this week, London Mayor Sadiq Khan's plan to expand his ULEZ to all of London was challenged at the High Court. Meanwhile, in Cambridge, a local Tory taxi driver won a by-election campaign campaign to block the city's planned congestion charge. Well, join me now to discuss this is Howard Cox, founder of Fairfield UK, who was at the High Court this week and is also standing as a candidate in the next May's London mayoral election for the Reform Party. So, Howard, good evening to you. Thanks for joining us. First of all, um, tell us a bit about what happened in court today and the drama that unfolded. Hello, Martin. It's nice to be on your show. Thank you very much. Well, it's interesting when you think about this. It's a major judicial review. Um, and it only took eight hours, two hours each morning and two hours each afternoon, four hours. And uh, it's a bit like watching paint dry. There's a lot of procedural aspects being debated in there on both sides of the, the case. And uh, there was a lot of things missing, uh, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, but this is about whether his process of actually making the decision of actually uh, 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 making the ULES extension being introduced in August was lawful. It's not about the decision itself. And that's what is, is frustrating. As uh, the, the Lord Justice Swift was actually very forensic, asking questions on both sides, and I was, his attention to detail was brilliant. I was very impressed with that. But there, there was no clue as what to happen. And we won't know until June, uh, July the 31st. And it's interesting, Howard, how um, we've seen... Um, Boris Johnson writing in tomorrow's Daily Mail coming out against Ulez. Rather ironic, seeing as how the Conservatives brought the policy in. Oh, that, I couldn't believe that when I saw that. I've seen the actual article already, and I just, I, I'm staggered by the, you know, this duplicity that goes on in various political parties. What was missing from the, the judicial review, yes, in my opinion, was the most important one was the fact that uh, uh, Sadi Khan, the dishonest mayor of London, manipulated the public consultation process. Surely that was unlawful. Two out of three said they uh, were against uh, the, the actual ULES expansion going ahead. Um, and he even ordered cameras uh, before the public consultations results were, were announced. All those sorts of things happened. And, uh, and even his TFL, air quality uh, uh, results, showed that there would be no demonstrable difference uh, uh, when ULES extension is actually put in place. So all those things were not discussed at the judicial review. And that's the frustration for most people looking on. So, Howard, of course, Sadiq Khan would say that um, he's saving 4,000 lives per year by bringing a new lens through clean air. What do you reply to that? Well, I put together a freedom of information request and I got the response earlier this week. Uh, I'm going to be announcing what, uh, my response to that. Um, um, for, well, 4,000 people didn't die. It's, the actual question is on the word premature. And uh, the reports by the uh, various bodies, the IPCC, the IEA, all these sorts of things, they are saying there's premature death. And that premature death is a matter of days. And it's a modelling process. That's what it is. Just like we had in COVID. And as you are well aware, the modelling didn't go too well with that. That 4,000 people haven't died. And London is still one of the cleanest, if not one of the cleanest cities in the world. And that's down to what the WHO say. So, really, all of this is a complete sham. And I hope, I hope Justice Swift does actually come to what everyone believes should be and that the ULAS uh, extension should not be go ahead. OK, Howard Cox, thank you for joining us tonight. We have to leave it there. That's it from me today. Thanks to all of my panel and guests. And, of course, you at home. Up next is Mark Dolan. Mark, what meat do you have on the menu for us tonight? Well, plenty of meat and two veg as well, Martin. We've got a really busy show. Tennis legend Virginia Wade live on the programme. Of course, she won Wimbledon. How does that feel? What's her reaction to Andy Murray going out? Should he hang up his tennis racket for good? And in my take at 10, I'll be dealing with the people that would like to close down GB News. We are subject to a shocking advertising boycott, and I'll be dealing with those bullies at 10 o'clock. In my big opinion... The case for cash is absolutely crucial. Uh, the idea of a cashless society is an attack on people power. Plus, my top pundits and tomorrow's papers, your emails as well. Uh, plus, we'll be talking about compulsory national service for gang members. See you in two. That warm feeling inside from Boxed Boilers. Proud sponsors of weather on GB News.
Hello again, it's Adam McGiven here from the Met Office with the GB News forecast. A sunny and hot weekend at first for some before the inevitable thundery breakdown and much fresher conditions arrive from the Atlantic. We've got a couple of areas of low pressure spinning out to the west of the UK. They're helping to draw up this increased heat and humidity before they send some weather fronts in and we see this thundery breakdown later Saturday and into Sunday. But before that happens, a clear and dry night for many. We will see the cloud thicken across Wales and the southwest, and some showers will push into Devon and Cornwall by dawn. But it's a muggy night wherever you are, 17, 18, 19 Celsius fairly widely. Even in the north of Scotland, mid-teens are possible. But a fine start for Scotland and for much of England first thing Saturday. Sunny skies, temperatures shooting up, but the showers in the southwest will quickly push into central areas, developing into an intense area of thundery rain by the afternoon, with the risk of localised flooding, large hail and frequent lightning, particularly towards the Midlands into northern England and southern Scotland later. But ahead of that rain could reach the low 30s in East Anglia. Much fresher conditions arrive by the start of Sunday. Any thundery rain clearing for the north of Scotland, but further spells of wet weather likely to brush past southeast England before some heavy showers and thunderstorms develop across Northern Ireland, Wales and the southwest into the afternoon. We keep the showers and some thunderstorms into the start of next week, but it also turns cooler. That warm feeling inside from boxed boilers Proud sponsors of weather on GB News.
Happy Friday, one and all. Isn't the weather glorious? We've got that Friday feeling. It's nine o'clock on television, on radio and online in the United Kingdom and across the world. This is Mark Dolan tonight. In my big opinion, the push for a cashless society is an attack on people power. Cash is king. My Mark Meets guest is British tennis icon, former Wimbledon winner, Virginia Wade OBE.